how government agencies are using data and data analytics, data visualization, and all these other tools to advance their mission and deliver more value to citizens. This event is part of the first annual Data Innovation Day. And the purpose of Data Innovation Day is to raise awareness about the benefits and opportunities that come from increased use of information. And we're doing this by bringing together individuals and organizations uh, who are leading innovators in the use of data. So in the, the first year of launching this, we have over 60 partners uh, on the first annual Data Innovation Day, including international partners, uh, big tech companies, startups, nonprofits, universities, and even city governments that are at the leading edge of a lot of this work. Um, this morning's event is the uh, first of two events that we have planned for today in Washington, D.C. Uh, the second event will be at the Reserve Officers Association, where we're going to be looking at data innovation in the U.S. economy. Uh, we will have a panel discussion that starts at noon and goes to 1.30, and then following that, we're going to have a series of demos from 1.30 to 3 o'clock uh, that will be showing you know, data analytics and data visualization in action. Uh, so if you leave here still confused, go there. If you leave here wanting more, go there as well because you'll, you'll get a lot more of it. Uh, we also have a number of partner events today, um, both uh, on the West Coast and the East Coast. We have an event in Philadelphia tonight. Uh, we have some out in Silicon Valley, and we have some online. So you can go to datainnovationday.org uh, to find out more about these events. And finally, um, all day you can follow the events, and uh, if you have any questions, um, if you're watching remotely, you can ask questions using that hashtag on Twitter, Data Innovation. So today, uh, here, we have an excellent set of panelists who will be discussing how data is used in different areas of government. Um, so we have a, a great set of panelists. Uh, we have David Forrest, who's a senior advisor to Chief Technology Officer at the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, for the past year, David has led the team responsible for the creation of the new healthdata.gov, which is one of HHS's key open data initiatives. Uh, we have Richard Kulada. Uh, Richard is a deputy director in the Office of Educational Technology for the Department of Education. Here, his work focuses on leveraging open data to create more personalized learning experiences for students. Um, right here, we have Austin Brown. Austin is a senior analyst at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Laboratory and he also moonlights as the Deputy Chief Technology Officer <laughs> for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy. And you know, DOE has been a, a leading agency in regards to opening up data sets and encouraging the private sector to then go out and, and uh, make other data available and, and create interesting applications with this data. And Austin's been involved in, in many of these efforts. Um, Jason O'Connor is Vice President of Analysis and Mission Solutions at Lockheed Martin. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in uh, leading technology and research efforts, and he currently focuses on predictive analytics. And, uh, and last, we have Teresa Carlson, who is the head of Worldwide Public Sector at Amazon, where she is responsible for strategy, operations, and sales for Amazon's web services and cloud computing business. She has over 20 years of experience as a business executive and was named as Washingtonian Magazine's 100 Most Powerful Women and a Tech Titan for her contributions to the IT industry in D.C., Teresa, I think you were named the Tech Titan the same year that our uh, Rob Atkinson, president oh, of IPF, yeah, is named so. as well. So uh, we're in good company here. Um, so what we're going to do is um, I've asked our panelists to start off by talking a little bit about what some of the government agencies are doing and where there are opportunities uh, with government data uh, and their opening remarks. Then we'll kick it off into a little bit of a discussion, and uh, we'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions. So um, have those ready, and again, you can also send them in on Twitter if you're watching on the webcast. Uh, so with that, uh, David, I'd like to ask if you'd start us off uh, here and talk a little bit about what HHS has been doing in this area. Sure. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and if you can just hit the button on your mic. All right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, good morning. Uh, I joined the Department of Health and Human Services last February. Uh, prior to that, I had Elizabeth Warren stand up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I was the Chief Technology Officer for Elizabeth over there. Uh, and then Anish Chopra, who at the time was the United States Chief Technology Officer, asked me to help Todd Park, who is our current Chief Technology Officer, stand up healthdata.gov. Uh, and it was a very exciting project that I was more than happy to, to come over and help the department uh, set healthdata.gov uh, up. Um, I want to, so I've, my time in government is very short. Uh, and I uh, spent 16 years at The Motley Fool, which is a personal finance and investing education website. Uh, and so I'm used to, you know, cut off chains and flip-flops and walking around the office and, and, and all this government suit-wearing stuff is not kind of native to me. So 
Uh, I brought a slightly different perspective to things uh, in, in the government space that I think has served me well uh, and hopefully uh, has rubbed off on some of the folks um, in government, specifically agile development. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, but I want to give an overview of HHS for those of you who are not familiar with it and talk about some of the most innovative uses of data. Uh, so for anyone who's not familiar with HHS, it is a massive organization, right? It has 11 operating divisions, a $1.3 billion budget. Uh, you know, some of the you know, more well-known agencies that fall underneath the HHS umbrella are the Food and Drug Administration, Centers for Disease Control, National Institute of Health, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. This is big stuff. I mean, this is everywhere in our economy, everywhere in, in American life and society. Uh, and so there are literally thousands of data sets that <coughs> exist within the department. Uh, and so when the president issued his open government directive when he, uh, on the first day to, after he took office, um, you know, Secretary Sebelius followed suit and said, free the data. We want all the data to, to live. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the backstory, data.gov got stood up in about three months thanks to our friends at GSA. Uh, and late last year, late in 11, uh, Health and Human Services decided that they wanted to bring that in-house. Uh, to a certain extent. And so we spent about three months and created healthdata.gov in time for the current, uh, the 2012 version of Health Data Palooza, uh, which I'll also talk about in a, in a second. Um, and so there are many areas within the department in all of this data and all of this money and such a widespread impact on the American public uh, to innovate and, and to kind of uh, be leaders. and. I am not familiar with every government agency. I've only seen the insides of a few of them. HHS is really doing some incredible work that I think because we can't compete with the Googles and the Apples of the world in terms of innovation, uh, I think goes unnoticed. I mean, the government gets a bad rap for being slow. Uh, not so much, right, which is good. I think the, 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 the dark secret about government agencies is they're not as slow or as bureaucratic as you might think they are. Uh, these are big organizations. There are 80,000 people in Department of Health and Human Services, and you can't have everybody be a leader and an innovator. You need, you know, 5,000 innovators and everybody else who's willing to be versatile. Uh, and so, you know, the good news is uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, and I'll spend a couple more minutes telling you about it. I'm happy to kind of further the discussion as we go. So, uh, as I said, we, the Health Data Initiative is kind of the crown jewel for open data at Health and Human Services. Todd Park started this three years ago. He brought Tim O'Reilly together uh, with the head of Medicare and Medicaid, who had never met one another. And it, it was kind of stunning to me that they had never met, but he got them in a room and said, we should do something here. Uh, and that something started as probably 10 people in a room three years ago, ended up with 1,500 people at the Washington Convention Center last year for Health Data Palooza. Uh, John Bon Jovi was our keynote. He was great. I got a picture with John Bon Jovi. It was very, very exciting for me personally um, as, as a child of the 80s. Uh, and so, uh, you know, but he's actually doing some pretty good work, uh, you know, trying to marry um, homeless shelters up with uh, place, uh, homeless folks with people, uh, beds, uh, homeless shelters that have beds, doctors that are going to be in the area. So they're using data uh, to kind of pull these two uh, disparate things together. The one thing that I learned that was somewhat shocking to me is that the one um, possession that many homeless folks have is a wire, is a cellular device. They've got a smartphone. Uh, and so they, you can create applications for these people that will say, here are shelters that have open beds. There are shelters where there will be doctors at certain time, and so John Bon Jovi was leading uh, the charge on that, and that, that was this kind of cool project to, to learn more about. Um, but the Health Data Initiative, largely speaking, uh, Todd brought all these folks together. It was feds, tech firms, academia, uh, public health communities, healthcare delivery firms, and the result was the Health Data Consortium. Uh, 17 organizations, HHS is one of them, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is another, Academy Health, Consumer Reports, the Mayo Clinic, um, there, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and every year they've been putting on healthdata.gov. I mean, pardon me, they've been uh, putting on the Health Data Palooza. Uh, and in it, you'll see if you go to the website, which is hdiforum.org, uh, all of the different things that happen in 12, from application challenges to uh, just all these various different use cases about how people are using uh, electronic medical records differently. Uh, it, it's, it's a very exciting space right now. Uh, and I encourage you, June 3rd and 4th of this year will be the HDI. Uh, Health Data Palooza 4, and so uh, mark your calendars and go to that site and check out the, uh, the agenda for that. Um, so as we get on with our, our list, um, and Daniel, stop me at any time on, if I'm running over here, but healthdata.gov is what we stood up. Again, It was we used lean and agile kind of uh, 
best practice is to get this up in 53 days. Uh, Todd wanted it for Health Data Palooza, and so we got it for him. Uh, there are roughly 400 data sets that are open data sets there, the, and I said the department has thousands. And so, you know, part of my job is to take that 385 and bring it to 1,000 or 2,000 or whatever there is. Um, so, you know, we are uh, completely open source. Uh, we will federate with, uh, we're using best practices in terms of data catalogs. We're using CCAN. I don't want to get too too geeky for you here now, but anybody who's interested in the software stack and how we built, we're in Teresa's cloud, uh, which is great. Uh, and so, um, other programs inside of the department that you, you may or may not be familiar with, everyone I think has probably heard of Blue Button, which the VA uh, kind of pioneered. That's very near and dear to our hearts as well because a lot of it is Medicare data. Uh, and so we have a vested interest in standardizing around uh, you know, electronic health records so that individuals can get access to their records. And I imagine once this happens, and it's not that far off, uh, the world will change in a very exciting way where you can then say, okay, I want my records. I'm actually going to then trust a third party to evaluate how well you're doing for me, doctor. Uh, that, there's no way for people to kind of vet their medical professionals right now, and I think that world is going to change uh, because of this. The secretary, Secretary Sebelius, has an innovation fellows program where we invite subject matter experts from around the world into the department to help us solve key problems. Uh, so there are two, you know, there are lots of great effects here, one of which is they help us solve key problems, but they also kind of uh, are infectious in their enthusiasm for change. Uh, and so in the same way that the Presidential Innovation Fellows, we have the Secretary's Innovation Fellows Program. Um, CMS, which is Center for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, they actually launched a business division this year that is entirely dedicated to getting data out there. And this is somewhat unprecedented, right? There's a business division where they've got PL, so to speak, to the extent that the government can have PL. Uh, but their specific goal is to get their data more widely used. And so they've got lots of rich, I mean, just the uh, medical claims database <laughs> is maybe the richest and most valuable data set in the world. Uh, and so that is restricted access, but they are trying to get that into a, as many uh, hand, into the hands of as many people uh, who will make good use of it as possible. Uh, Niall Brennan heads that up uh, over at CMS. Uh, I'm happy to make an introduction to Niall for anybody who's interested there. Uh, last couple things, HHS has an Innovates program. Uh, it's been running for about three and a half years now. It's the Secretary's Innovates program where uh, really the goal is cultural change, right? And so we are basically giving permission for anybody to come up with an idea and we'll fund it. Uh, on how to kind of change things in, from an internal processing standpoint. It's not strictly data, but I thought I'd mention it from an innovation standpoint. Uh, and really, if you imagine that, again, you've got an 80,000 person organization and there can only be so many leaders, what you really want is to create a culture that says, okay, you have permission to do this. Uh, and, and not only do you have permission, but we actually really, really want you to, and we're gonna celebrate it, uh, and we're gonna have, you know, force adoption of the, the best practices. And so that's been exciting. Uh, some of the things that have come about in just the past year that I've been there have been, have been remarkable. Uh, and I guess the last piece that HHS does a fair amount of work on, specifically the Brian Sivak's uh, office, the Chief Technologies Office, is this idea of the public-private partnership. We spend a lot of time with codathons and hackathons and trying to marry up developers, you know, 22-year-old Ruby on Rails developers with uh, subject matter experts who have brilliant ideas about how to use data. Uh, for my money, the single biggest problem or the single biggest barrier to wonderful things happening in the world of data innovation is that you've got the people who are brilliant at creating these applications have no idea how to use it or what it is. So you've got to somehow marry them. And I'll, I'll close with this quick story. Uh, we went after Health Data that I felt launched over to the Administration for Children and their families and sat down with all of the data leads who were responsible for uploading this data. And so it was an hour long meeting and about 45 minutes was just me droning on about how to use the system, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the last 15 minutes was idea generation from these people who are passionate about the data, who curate this, who care about the people that this data serves. Uh, and so when I asked them how they thought we should use it, I think they were stunned that anybody cared what they thought. And so, you know, these are the people who think every day about how to use this data. And within about five minutes, there were at least three people who just wouldn't shut up. 
and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. They had a million ideas, and, and I was like, okay, let's give somebody else a turn now. And uh, <laughs> and so you know, when you, uh, I think there are a lot of rock stars that are sitting in in the, the basements of uh, federal agencies around who are just waiting for somebody to ask them, how should we use this data? Uh, and so if if uh, I'm trying to spend a fair amount of time internally getting people to open up about the best uses of it. Uh, and so I'll stop there. Uh, hope that's a good enough overview of what we're doing. Thanks, David. Um, Richard, you want to talk a little bit about what uh, education department's doing? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so some great stuff that we hear from, from HHS in a number of ways. We, we have uh, uh, stolen some of the uh, pages of their playbook uh, tried to follow the, the great lead that they've done over there. One of the, the key concerns of this administration, the president, is that uh, we provide access to learning to all students, that everybody have the opportunity, um, and also that we find a way to do that in, in ways that can lower costs so that people can uh, afford to take advantage of these opportunities when they have. Um, as you look at that, though, there are some challenges. One of the challenges is that really, really important educational decisions are often made with very little information. Right. So often the choice of what college a student goes to is made by, you know, like the coolness of the flyer they get in the mail, right? Or the sport team that you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, these are these are serious decisions that have financial and uh, sort of lifelong effects that are often just kind of made on a on a whim. Uh, and so it was clear to us that we needed to have much more data infused into the system in order to provide more access and help students and parents and teachers, by the way, make better decisions uh, about about education. So we were thinking, you know, what, what we really need is this uh, kind of like a learning positioning system, right? So you think of a GPS, and a GPS, as I drive, as I drove down here this morning, I kept going off in wrong directions. A GPS shows kind of where, where you're going, and when you get off, shows directions back to get on, on track, right? And gives you information along the way to help you make as efficient as possible a path to your final destination. Right? So why don't we have a learning positioning system? Or why don't we have a tool that can show learners where they want to go based on what they're saying, give them different options to get there, and when they get off track, help them get back on. So it's a great idea, and technically it's actually not that hard to build, with one giant exception, and that is that all of the data that's needed in order to make that happen it was not available in an easy way, certainly not in a way that developers can take advantage of. So that's what we started out to do with uh, the Education Data Initiative. And we went out and said, how do we make enough data available? And how do we incentivize people to participate in a way that this learning positioning system could be built? And, and it's learning positioning systems. I don't envision one particular thing, but lots of different tools that help students figure out where they're going. So one of the challenges that some people don't realize is, uh, unlike other departments, the Department of Education actually has uh, very little of the education data that's out there, right? Because of the decentralized nature of education in this country, most student information is at schools and local, state and sort of local levels, right? The Department of Ed only has a small amount of aggregate data that comes up and, and can be helpful for uh, looking at areas of the country where schools are, are working well, but when it comes to actually providing guidance and support for an individual learner, we don't have any of that information. Uh, with one exception, and that is when it comes to student loan information. We do have student-level data about student loan uh, information, but otherwise we don't have it. And so we had to take a slightly different approach as opposed to just saying, here's the data that we have at the department, we'll open it up. Uh, we said we need to actually go out and partner with everybody who has this data at the schools and districts and college and you know, community level and encourage them to open it. So we launched a program called the My Data uh, button, again, similar to the, what happened with the uh, uh, Blue button. But we went out to these, these software vendors and people that make that hold student data and said, we challenge you to uh, give students access to their own data. Allow them to export it and take it with them off of your system in a uh, common, open, interoperable format, machine-readable format. And a number of them stepped up to the plate, quite a few actually, and said, we will do it. We're in. And so all of this data suddenly is becoming available. And of course, in the department, we decided to you know, eat our own dog food. And, and the one area where we do have student level data, which is uh, around the financial aid information, we also put an op option that allows students to download all that data off of their, our system. Uh, obviously, they're authenticated in. We know who they are. So, but offload that data and use that with other tools to, um, to make some, some better decisions. So a couple other things. We also said, in addition to knowing student data, we also need to know data about learning content. 
So there's tons of content out there, all over the internet. There's lots and lots of learning content. Turns out it's very hard to find learning content that's aligned <coughs> to a specific learning objective. Very hard. So if you're going to build a tool that said, hey, based on we see your grades, you know, really stinking math here, and you really have trouble with, uh, you know, whatever, dividing fractions, we could then say, here are some learning tools, some videos, some whatever, that we could suggest to you to be able to pick up those skills. But you can only do that if somebody has gone through and made alignment information said, hey, this video that you have here is aligned to this particular standard. Uh, and, and that didn't exist. There were people that were kind of doing it one-off. You know, so, so like Khan Academy, for example, would, would register some of their videos. But that only is there, you know, in their little section of the internet. So we launched an initiative called Learning Registry. It's an open source initiative. Anybody can participate. We don't even have to know when somebody participates. It's an open, uh, open initiative. And we basically said, Anybody that has learning content, anybody that's a content publisher, whether you're a library or a commercial pu content publisher, or whatever it is, take the metadata about that content and register it with this database. And what you're going to say is what the learning content is and what it's aligned to. Right? So put all the metadata in one central location. Even if the content spread all over the internet, that's fine. We're going to put it all in one location. And then when there's a common location with information about education data, people can start to build tools on top of that platform that start to recommend the exact content for the person that needs it based on their on their data. So, so one quick example to sort of make sense out of all that. So if I'm, a, uh, let's say, a, a teacher, and uh, I'm trying to find the best content to recommend to a particular student, learning registry with the metadata that, has, that it has uh, there from everybody that's contributing can say, we can recommend this particular content because we know that you're teaching students who may be predominantly uh, English language learners at the fifth grade in science, right? That recommendation is going to be very different than the recommendation of the teacher across the hall uh, that is teaching predominantly native English speakers sixth grade math, right? And so, or even science, right? But it, it, can, it can help do a better job of teeing up the best uh, learning content. So I, certainly later, if people have more questions, I can go uh, dive deeper into that. But right now, we're working with uh, developers, with uh, hackathons and codathons across the country to encourage uh, both large companies and small startups to build tools and apps on these great platforms that we have. The Learning Registry, which is open data about content, and the My Data approach, which is open data about student uh, learning information, right, if that makes sense. So when you marry those two up, that has everything in place to create this learning positioning system that I think uh, uh, we all need. Final, final thought here for, uh, before I uh, stop with my overview, and that is um, we just started a program at the Department of Ed called Race to the Top District. Some of you may be familiar with that. Race to the Top District is a half a billion dollar program, B, B billion, half a billion dollar program that gives funding to schools specifically to develop personalized learning environments. So in that uh, program, and uh, these were just awarded, these awards were just made uh, a couple weeks ago. In that program, there's language that says things like, students need to have access to their data in near real time. Right? Parents and teachers need to have access to all student data in near real time. So we are trying to use that as a great example of how we can shift a bunch of schools across the country to leveraging data for instantaneous feedback, real time feedback using this new data and using this open information about learning content. And we believe that a combination of these sort of factors playing together uh, can radically change what education looks like and feels like for people who are making decisions and making really important uh, decisions about their future, uh, currently based on very little information. And we think we uh, are going to be able to radically change that. So that's a quick overview. Happy to continue and answer other questions afterwards. Great. Uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, Austin, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about what DOE is in this area? Give it a second. Okay. It's not real. Time. It's, it's ready. It's ready. No, it's, it'll it's be great. Yeah. Oh, I think that, that one needs to be off. Yeah, this one be off. Okay. Am I fairly audible at least? Good. Okay. So. Um, so I found out uh, probably about 4.30 or 5 yesterday that I'd be speaking here. So I want to talk, and that this is not, not just to complain about, about no time to prep, because this is actually something I love to talk about. Uh, but um, 
actually the basis for, for a little bit of a personal experience with, with big data that I have on a daily basis. Um, so a, a little quick poll. How many people took transit to get here of some form or another? Okay. So any, any other bus riders in here? Yeah. So when you, when you left your house, uh, did you go and wait at the bus stop? Or did you check? How many people checked when the bus was coming before they came? Okay. So maybe we have a little bit of a ways to go. But um, I, I, was, I, counted up the, the, I counted up the time it took me to figure out how I was going to get here this morning from when I found out I would be uh, speaking until, until right now. Um, when it said, okay, here's the address of where you'll be, I went to Google, uh, Google Maps. They have a transit trip planner that works pretty well. It said, here's where I live. Here's where I'm going. Here's about the time that I need to be there with some with a little leeway built in. It said, okay, you can take this route, this route, this route. There were three bus routes that were, that were pretty good options for me. I just live up in Columbia Heights. So it's straightforward, coming straight south. Um, then when I was ready to go this morning, um, I was able to pull up my phone. I have the three relevant stops as favorites in an app that uses data from WMATA, from the, the Transit Authority. Um, with real-time bus information, and rather than go pick a stop and wait at it, I just asked my phone which the next bus was going to be that I could go take. So I knew that I should take the bus down 7th Street instead of the one down 11th Street. It was coming in two minutes rather than in, in 16 minutes. Um, you know, it may sound trivial, but what it meant is that I invested about a minute and a half of my time, much less than I've now spent telling you about it, in figuring out how I would get here this morning and then actually making my trip here more efficient. Um, the reason that this matters <coughs> Because in the years, even in the few years since I've been in DC, I've been here in about, uh, for about four years, they've taken the system from being a system that you had to plan to use, you had to go in and, and read timetables, you had to get frustrated when the bus didn't show up on time, to one that, that actually you can pretty much just use now if you have the right tools available. And there's still a ways to go, there's still some data quality issues. Nothing is more frustrating than a ghost bus. Uh, those are buses that they say exist and then the time just goes by and there's no bus. Uh, nothing is more frustrating than a ghost bus, but there's been enormous progress and it's really come a long way. This probably sounds like a weird thing to talk about when I'm supposed to be talking about energy, um, but if we can take transit systems from systems that people have to plan how to use to ones that they just get up in the morning and poke a button and then use, um, that actually has pretty profound energy implications. So just, that's just um, one of my daily one of my daily brushes. That's obviously not a data set that we we uh, we curate or run with it at DOE, but it's uh, it's one that I'm an enthusiastic consumer of. Um, so I come at, I come at energy from uh, or I come at energy data from the uh, analysis perspective. So wanting to know what we can do in energy to make it more efficient and more renewable in the long term. And I got thinking about data originally because data in many many cases in energy is a huge barrier, if not the barrier, to adoption of energy efficiency and renewable energy. And I'll go through a couple examples of that. Um, the office that I work with works on, uh, it's called the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. They work on energy efficiency, so, uh, so the demand side, how we use energy in buildings and vehicles, and on renewable energy. Uh, so how we supply energy from things like solar panels and, and, and wind energy. And in each of these areas, we've started to discover ways that data um, has the potential to completely transform the way that we do business and the potential for energy. Um, in many cases, uh, in many cases, we think data provides a solution to the key barriers uh, that are that are uh, in place against energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, so I, I don't know. I'll just I won't take up too much time, but I wanted to go through a couple examples in each of those uh, in each of those areas. Uh, EERE works with ten different programs um, and uh, divided between energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, on the efficiency side, we've had dozens of studies over the last few years looking at the financial potential for, uh, for energy efficiency. We know there's a huge amount of money out there to be made. We know there's a huge amount of money out there to be saved with energy efficiency. Um, and then the question always comes up, well, if there's so much money out there, why doesn't it happen? Uh, well, one of the answers is that people tend not to have the relevant information. Um, one solution we've developed to this is a database of incentives uh, that are provided at the federal, state, and local level. So you can go into this database and say, here's where I live, what, if, what incentives are available for me uh, from each of these government levels for energy efficiency or for renewable energy. Now that's a good start. Um, that means there's a place that people can go. How many have ever heard about this database called the Desire database? Okay. So again, not very many. We don't expect that everybody is going to know about these things. Um, you can find it if you Google it, that's fine, but that's just not how people work. We don't incorporate that into our everyday lives. So what we've done is taken the next step 
and made those data available um, in an automated sense with an API through the Open Energy Information or Open EI website. Why does that matter? Well, that means that now um, organizations, companies, individuals can build software that interacts with those incentives and uses it in an automated manner. We hope that this can open up business models. For example, somebody could come in and say, I'm going to use this when I'm providing a home energy audit to tell you right in your, your home energy audit report what incentives are available to you. Then you as a homeowner wouldn't even have to know this database exists at all. And that's the way we want it. We don't, we're not trying to sell databases, we're trying to get energy efficiency out there. Um, we have uh, a bunch of other databases that we hope will participate in the business model like the, uh, in a similar way. Uh, we have a database that we've built of all of the energy efficiency measures we're aware of in the world that you can do. Uh, every HVAC technology that you can conceive of that's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, its efficiency and its estimated cost. We hope that that can be a useful database for, um, for business models. And then the one I'm probably most excited about uh, and, and makes us extreme copycats, um, we've, we've started to look at the blue button model and say this has enormous potential for connecting individuals to their data. Um, and so we've been enthusiastic participants in a broader effort to get your home energy use out there through something we've uh, very uncreatively called the green button. Um, <laughs> And, uh, do you have any Pepco customers in the house? I would assume there's quite a few. Yeah. So you can actually go now to the Pepco website and hit their green button button and download uh, your energy use data as long as far back as it, as they have it on an hourly usage basis. Now, unless you're a big energy nerd like me, you probably don't ha really want to spend a lot of time looking over your hourly energy use data. I've now spent way too much time looking at it because it's really cool. I can see, oh, there's where my, my, my programmable thermostat kicks on in the morning and in the evening. I can see that in my, in my data. I, I fully acknowledge that many people won't care about that, but the advantage is then you can make that data available and it's in a standard format to third party providers that would be able to provide a variety of energy services without you having to care about it, without you having to go through a complicated process of making that data available for use. Uh, so it's a few examples on the energy efficiency side. Um, data is an enormous barrier for renewable energy as well. Um, two examples out of many. Uh, one is in geothermal. So are people familiar with geothermal power? I'm, not, I'm never sure what, what people are familiar with. So, so you, you find the simplest incarnation, you find hot water underground, you use it to, turn, uh, to, gener to generate steam, to turn a turbine to make electricity. It's great in that it's renewable. It's challenging in that other than when it's shooting out of the ground, uh, you don't know where to find it. It's really, really hard to find uh, hot water if you don't know where you're looking. We have a great uh, overall resource assessment, so we think we know the regions of the country where it is, but that doesn't really help a company that is going out there and drilling wells where every dry well is an enormous uh, ding on the balance sheet. Uh, we're, we're building now a database of geothermal uh, resource assessment, which is actually the result of individual explorations. Um, so not, not a low resolution map of where we think the resource might be, but what's actually been found where people drill. Um, this, this is now being built with participation from the uh, full geothermal community, um, and we plan to make that data available uh, totally open in the, in the long term so that people can go match that data up and figure out maybe we have much better methods for predicting where we'll find hot water or hot rock and where we won't. Um, on the solar side, uh, so solar, solar PV is one that people are probably the most familiar with, that's photovoltaics, panels on your houses. Um, but one problem is people, when they want to install it, they often don't know um, what's my rate of return going to be? Uh, how expensive is this going to be? Is this going to be something that's worth it? And then therefore they will have a lot of trouble getting financing if they want to go out and do that. Uh, we've started to build an open PV database uh, that's to collect data on the installation of as many uh, PV systems as we can get. We have more than 160,000 installations uh, in the database already, representing uh, 3,900 megawatts, 3.9 gigawatts, which is a very significant share of all the solar that we think is out there. That's significant because that means we have cost data, we have uh, installation size data on all of these. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a consistent record that gets out there and says, here's what things cost, here's what people get out of it in terms of their electricity generation, and we hope that as this information increases in quality, it should make the financing case become more and more of a slam dunk, where a bank can look at that and say, we're now very comfortable in providing money for people to go out and produce uh, and put solar panels on their house. As that gets more standardized, the costs will come down further, and you only increase the case and get some, some better feedback. 
Um, it's a couple examples on renewables. Um, I have, I'll start with one more example on the vehicle side. This is what I spend most of my time thinking about is transportation. That's why I dork out on transit data all the time. Um, not everybody, it turns out, is going to want to ride public transit all the time, but we do expect that we will have an increasing <coughs> diversity in fuels for people's vehicles going forward. Uh, our office works on electric vehicles, we work on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, we, look, we work on vehicles that can plug in or run on gasoline, and we work on vehicles that can run on E85 and other alternative fuels. That's a huge diversity of fuels. That's a big change from the model where you go to the gas station and you fill up on the only fuel. I mean, people are maybe familiar with diesel, but that has big challenges because people want to just go to a gas station. So how are people going to find the, uh, the, the stations that are available for them to, to refuel at? Um, we now have a database at the Alternative Fuels Data Center that has essentially, as far as we know, every publicly available E85 station, uh, electric vehicle charging station, and, uh, and the few hydrogen uh, filling stations available in the US, California. Um, why is this important? Well, it means that now you can go to the map and look in DC, just take a look, it's pretty cool. There's actually many more stations than people are aware of. Um, and it provides the basis for a community of people. I heard a great story about, um, uh, about uh, the early uh, adopters in electric vehicles. They have forums that they've now developed where they go out and they add data on top of this data set. Right? So they say, it's great to know where it is. That's a start, to know where this charger is. But what I want to know is, is it always full? Is there always some other EV owner there, or is this one that, that's not always occupied? And so they started to layer data on top of that, saying, this station isn't just there, it's usually accessible. Or, man, there's always some leaf owner who leaves their car there all day. Like, don't even bother. Uh, and it's really become the basis, very early, of course, it's still an early adopter stage, but it's really become the basis of a, of a community that's able to use those data. Um, so I think those are the those are the main ones I'll talk about. Um, if people have questions as we go through, um, uh, we have at least one or two examples in each of the areas that we work. Um, and we're really excited to see these examples cropping up. Um, we're, Let me stop you there. Yeah, sure. Because um, we're gonna come back and, and dig into it a little bit more. Uh, Jason, why don't you take it down and talk a little bit? I, I mean, I know you've been working in you know this area of predictive analytics and looking at what you can do with data at the kind of the meta level and high level. Talk a little bit about that, and maybe if you can. Uh, bring any examples of national security or public safety because I think that's another area that has a lot of interest. Sure, thank you, Dan. I'm smiling because I, I came here with three big notes. Um, when we talk about data innovation, I, the big three are you have to have the data, you have to have algorithms, and you have to have tradecraft. And that's exactly what I've been hearing from the table this morning. And in different flavors, everyone is talking about those same three concepts. Uh, my story. I'm the defense contractor at the room, so we've been engaged in what we would call analysis today for a long time, and it's typically been in optimizing systems. When I build a complex system, you care a lot about gaining efficiencies, optimizing it, uh, how it will operate, how it will be implemented, uh, and that's spanned all the way into things like you know business process re-engineering. So over the years, we've called data innovation, data analysis decision support, knowledge management, uh, systems analysis, modeling and simulation. There's been various ways that we've looked at this. Um, for, for me and, and my team, where this really came into focus for us was a little, right about two years ago uh, with the Arab Spring. And at that time, we had people who were doing optimization and modeling and simulation type work. And we said, you know, why don't you take a look at the situation that's brewing uh, in the Arab Spring and let's try to make some predictions based on data. And you know, for the record, this was not a capability or an operation that was up and running. We, we started from scratch at that moment in time. Uh, but we went cross domain. We had a social scientist, a linguist, and a computer programmer, basically. That was our core team. And we asked them to go look at whatever data was openly available. Uh, so they liking to have large data sets. Social media was a great source. Uh, news media was a great source. Look at these data sets. How do you make solid, concrete, and defensible predictions? Um, to our shock, that team, within days, had algorithms, was up and rolling, and country by country through the Arab Spring made predictions roughly six weeks in advance of final outcome that were accurate. Um, I think better than the fact that they could make basic predictions of outcomes was that they could numerically project it. They could say, you know, with an 80% confidence level, 
this particular nation, we believe, will see protests or riots. <coughs> this particular nation, we think, will see concessions. Here we'll see violence. They were actually able to numerically scale that. And that was what was really exciting to see, is what brought this all into focus for us. So that exercise went on. We were all very pleased with the results, happy to see that these techniques could work. And we realized suddenly we had a capability. We had an operation. We had a, a small core team. We had a network of social scientists and physical scientists, both across our corporation and also with academic partners that we could go to for unique expertise. And we started to realize that could be applied to a vast array of situations. We also realized that every one of those is different. Everyone's going to require a unique trade craft, a unique algorithm, unique data. It comes with each situation. Um, but since then, we've, we've seen the opportunity to use that same capability to look at logistics, to look at monitoring for pandemic breakouts, um, to look at uh, retail projections, to look at security measures. The same fundam fundamental approach can work if you step back and realize you've got to tailor it to the situation at hand. Uh, we were having some conversations before we started the actual webcast discussing that all right, you've got your data, you've got your algorithm, you've got your, your tradecraft. Yeah, the other hard part to this is knowing what question to ask. So it's a lot of engagement with our customers or internally when we're doing it for uh, corporate purposes to think through what exactly are we trying to solve here. Um, I'll give you a, kind of the, the lighthearted side of this we, we give the team fun things to do also. We say, you know, pick, pick the NBA All-Star team before it comes out. And we intentionally select individuals to work on it that are not NBA fanatics. We want to see if the trade craft works. And I'll tell you, we, we run better than 80% accuracy on those just by numerically analyzing the situation. Um, so it's, it's an exciting outcome that we see. Uh, the, this, the story of the, the real value that comes from this approach is that when you start to dig in and you start to look for these algorithms, it's not obvious. And that's where I think the, the truly unique value is here. You're looking for non-obvious correlations of data or unique comparisons of data, triggers in data that are going to give you a defensible position. And once you find it, put them in your library and look for the next closest question try to tailor them to that next question. That's the general approach. Um, we, we are incredibly excited with the progress we've seen over the last couple of years. We continue to see more and more questions in this area. And, uh, you know, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be brief here, so I'm just going to leave you with a reminder. Those three items, data algorithms and tradecraft, that's fundamentally what we're looking at at Data Innovation. We've seen it proven. Uh, we're using it today, and we're going to continue that approach. So. Uh, happy to engage and look forward to the dialogue. Great. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Um, and Teresa, if you can talk a little bit about um, you know, where you're seeing uh, opportunities, especially within kind of the business of government. We talked a lot about uh, services that are being delivered to citizens, but there's also a lot of government efficiency in this area. And you know, you're seeing this, I think, in, in virtually every agency that you're engaging with. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and let me start by saying, does anybody know what Amazon.com, Spotify, Instagram, Pinterest, Dropbox, edX, Phoenix University, Obama for America, NASA, Mars, Curiosity Landing, the Thousand Genomes, the Khan Academy, and the HHS Biosense program have in common? And the Learning Registry. And the Learning Registry. <laughs> They all run on Amazon Web Services. And why do they run on Amazon Web Services? Because they can scale very rapidly for big data sets. And when we talk about innovation with data and innovation in government and public sector, those are the kinds of things that government needs to continue to innovate and transform on. We just held our first ever reinvent conference. And we love that term, reinvent. You can take all the amazing data sets that are available to you already in government and reinvent those. Take advantage of those. Open up and explore all the amazing information that's available to the public and the scientists and the individuals running those programs for our citizens that are out there every day. And, you know, 
Um, big data just provides an opportunity for government to do things very differently. It's truly amazing all the information that is out there. And, you know, both Richard and Jason and Austin, I mean, they were all talking about the things that they have available within their agencies today that they're working to get out there. So the, so the citizens, we can every day take advantage of those things to improve what we're doing. And um, a couple of just great examples is uh, the Thousand Genomes Project with NIH. And I'm, I, this is something I personally am really passionate about because at NIH, they have this amazing, uh, it's the largest collection of hu human genome data that's out there. For a very long period of time, the, the average everyday researcher that wanted to do research on that genomic set couldn't get to it because they couldn't afford to get to it. They couldn't explore that and create the research that they wanted to create because they couldn't get to it, they couldn't provide, they couldn't buy the hardware, they just didn't have the resources. So we worked with NIH to move that data set or uh, make a duplicate of that data set in the Amazon Web Services cloud. And as a result, the first week that we moved that over, 3,200 new researchers worldwide crowdsourced on that data set. And that, uh, that provided the ability for them to begin to explore and take advantage of everything that was there. Now, why does that matter? It matters in numerous ways because it, it expedites and moves ahead the research capabilities. And in time zones, we can't really even think about today for how long it's taken in the past for drug research uh, to happen or our understanding of cancer and diseases. So, um, and let me give you another example of why that's very important. Another thing that government now can take advantage of and move over to the uh, public uh, commercial services as well as public sector services is in the past when a researcher would take advantage of a data set, they had a set of research that they were using. They would do that research, they would publish a white paper. That white paper would get distributed just as a normal paper that I would pass around to you, but they didn't have access to go in and look at the uh, computational algorithms that were utilized in that research. We've worked to develop something with researchers called an executable white paper. So today, now a researcher can publish their white paper, they can place it on the web. In that white paper, there's links. When they click on a link, pop, pop, what will pop out of that is the computational algorithms ready and available for the next researcher to use. So immediately, that researcher doesn't have to start at A anymore. They can start at B, C, D, and E. So the, the ability for them to then take over and just add on to that research is, is again, it's transformative. Um, the Berkeley AMP Lab is doing work, machine learning work, with a thousand, a million cancer patients with different cancer types. They are doing genomic mapping of those, of those patients and they believe that within 60 years that we will be able to live as a chronic illness with all cancer types or most cancer types. Now, they think that they are saying now because of the utilization of cloud and big data, this access that we just talked about, that could even speed up because they're able to do things again much more rapidly. Um, edX, uh, the the MOOC. Has anybody ever heard the term MOOC? So massive online course curriculum. Uh, it is on fire in education. And exa it's exactly what Richard talked about. It's the ability to give access to students globally, the ability to learn in new ways that they never had the access to in the past. And what MIT and Harvard came together for the first time to offer courses online for audit credits. Now, they themselves will even tell you they're trying to figure out how they monetize this for themselves. But today, what they're after is creating a community of learners out there to really, again, come together and crowdsource on problems. And Dr. Faust, who's the president of Harvard, was just here for the economic forum, and we went up and chatted with her. And she, she talked about, she gave an example in her talk at the economic um, 
club about how there was one sort of health bioinformatics class that they were offering and how these individuals from around the world, these amazing researchers are coming together in these courses to learn together and talk together and solve problems together. So because of the, these MOOC courses at edX, they're gathering researchers and you know, groups from around the world and then they're coming together in sort of mini clubs because they found each other and they're accessing information to solve, to solve real problems. So that's really the power of what can begin to happen. And another example of just true innovation, uh, NASA has just really been on the bleeding edge of their innovation. They came to us um, a few years ago, sort of when we first came to this market and said, you know, we've been really looking at what uh, cloud can do for our researchers. And their example, I love their what they're doing because uh, it's, it's very simple if you begin to think about it. They said, look, we hire, we pride ourselves on hiring the best and brightest researchers out there and scientists, these rocket scientists. We, we are doing our very best to get them to solve these problems. But what we're finding is they're spending a tremendous amount of time putting together their own servers. Like they, they want access to their data. So they're, so again, it's all back to data and the information and they want it when they want it and they need it and they really, that that's so valuable to them. And as a result, they said, we feel like that these scientists and researchers are spending so much time trying to put together their servers and get their information. They said, we need help getting them back to their job. We want to power them with tools so that on a daily basis, they don't have to worry about doing that anymore. So that's one of the things we've worked with NASA, JPL on, is getting them cloud tools available to them so that their researchers can have access to what they need. And a couple of real quick examples of that is uh, the NASA, uh, the Mars rover. So the Mars rover is an amazing little vehicle up there on Mars, running around, taking photographs of everything and sending pictures and uh, soil sample analysis and everything down to their labs. Well, um, and, I, and I don't quote me exactly on the amount of time, but when they put this project together, they thought this little rover would only last about six to 12 months. And three, four years later, this little thing's still moving along. <laughs> and they're like, we don't, this is like amazing information. Why would we not want all this data available? But they had not budgeted for this project. So we all know what happened. The government, we have money for our budget. So um, for, for a program. So we work with them. They reduce their cost uh, in an amazing way, and they're still running this now. And what they do is we put all these feeds out and make it accessible to researchers and educational institutions so they can be curious, right, about, about what's going on on, on, uh, on Mars. And they can also make more rapid decisions because of this sort of uh, real-time model on what they're going to do with the rover each day. So they want to make decisions about where they're going to send this little rover to do what it needs to do. And the same with the, you know, I'm very, very proud of the fact that we were part of the uh, Curiosity landing. I think that was amazing for all of us. They've said over and over it was one of the 2012 great events, and it was very exciting. And we were part of that, too, with the, with the feed. But again, it's about scale and access to information, because if you have to wait, if you have... Uh, large data sets sitting there, tons of information that are valuable, but you have no way to process it and analyze it and take advantage of it. It sits there almost like an unsung song. And I, I call it drip. You all probably heard the term drip, data rich, information poor. Uh, we need to make that information rich, data rich. And really, uh, the reason I'm so pleased to be here today is what, what my job is to do in working with government is to provide them tools, uh, building blocks, so that they can have access and new ways of getting to the data, processing it, and getting it out there in a manner that's uh, very uh, inexpensive, reliable, scalable, and uh, they can they can move it and be additive to it while taking advantage of all the great information they already have within their systems today. Um, the last thing I'll say that when I realized for the first time 
we use a term, and I've, I've got it out here, or, or a statistic. Um, each day, Amazon Web Services adds, adds the equivalent server capacity to power Amazon when it was a global $5.2 billion annual revenue e-commerce site. So every day globally, we're adding capacity to that. So what the reason I give you that statistic, it gives you an example of how data is growing and information. And who is the heart of that? Government. Government has more big data than anyone. U.S. government. Governments around the world have a lot of big data, but U.S. government has the most. And they have a ton sitting out there unlocked. And I think our goal, all of us probably sitting here, is to figure out how do we unlock that data in ways that are very useful for us to move things forward, provide economic growth, development, new jobs, solve for big disease, energy problems, education. And we have to be able to keep up uh, and be way ahead of everybody else. And this is a way, and we're innovating. And again, I'll, my last thing that I'll say on this is, the reason I gave you examples of some of these spot, you know, if you're very cool and young, everybody uses, but he uses Spotify in here, just for fun. So Spotify, like some of these new tools are, and all of these were started like that uh, because they wanted to scale rapidly and globally. So these are examples of innovation and transformation that's going on out there that government needs to be able to look at as examples and take advantage of uh, as the example of the healthcare clues. I thought was just another just great example of, of how, how you're trying to do that. So Great. Thanks, Teresa. So what I want to do, I mean, I think you've kind of touched on this issue already. And, and David, I want to bring you back into this part. Um, because if you, if you think about, you know, government and data, you know, this is both incredibly cutting edge and also, you know, very historical. Uh, you know, government uh, was, you know, census, you think of census, that was a huge big data thing when it was launched. IBM, of course, was involved with uh, computing there. And so government has a, a long history in data um, and, you know, everything from NASA to weather to, to mapping agencies. But there's something that's kind of unique that's going on right now. I mean, we are seeing these trends in agencies. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you think, you know, why do we have data innovation as a movement right now in government? What's, what's causing that? Is it the technology? Is it you know, the open uh, data initiative. What do you think is really driving it? Well, it's a combination of things. The, the, the capabilities are in place, right? I mean, the fact that AWS exists now and, and it didn't 15 years ago is a big deal. Uh, I think a lot of it is policy driven. I mean, you've got some very forward leaning, kind of open, uh, a very forward leaning open administration. Uh, you know, President Obama sent a very clear message when the very first thing he did, did was say, open it up. Uh, we want to be transparent about things. Uh, and so I think you've got a couple of things coming together at uh, this moment in time. And this is just the beginning. You know, for baseball fans, this is the bottom of the first inning, in, in my opinion. Uh, and so uh, you've got, as a result of this, uh, and you've also got network speeds that are increasing. I mean, network leads, right? So you've got uh, 100 gigabit Ethernet that's you know coming to the states, and then that, that's going to uh, further innovation. So there's lots of things that are happening at one point that are allowing this, uh, and the business models are popping up, and the incentives are also starting to be aligned. I mean, you've got uh, I won't uh, steal Andrew's thunder, but you've got Nest, right, who's uh, programmable thermostats uh, through Wi-Fi, through network capabilities uh, that are saving people 20, 30, 40 percent on their energy bills. This wasn't possible, you know, 10, 15 years ago. You, uh, and so I think there's just this this great confluence of events that are that are happening. And uh, and in each organization, we have the benefit um, of, uh, of of sharing information in places like this and. You've got evangelists like Todd and Nish who are going around door to door and knocking, you know, evangelizing to anybody who will listen. Uh, and so uh, these powerful stories and to a certain extent marketing, right? Blue button, just naming that thing made everybody understand what the heck it was. And, and there was a certain amount of, okay, I want to do that too. Uh, and so I think that, you know, all of this stuff is led to, you know, kind of this this revolution, if you will, or evolution. Mm -hmm. I, I think at some point we'll have a um, button in every color. Yeah. We're going to be running out of colors before we run out of buttons. And I just want to point out, Richard's over here creating his own big data. He has three devices. So you know that he's the big data guy just over with his device set. <laughs>
<laughs> That's what we preach, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, I mean, you know, even as we're streaming this event, uh, you know, it will be stored on servers and, you know, we're, we're adding to the, to the massive files of data. And actually, that gets to my next question because, you know, we hear a lot about um, big data, uh, but it's not just big data, it's also little data. And um, Austin and Richard, you talked a little bit about this in some of your examples. Um, you know, one that I think is really interesting uh, was that uh, Yelp recently announced last week that they've partnered with um, some city governments so that uh, they are now going to be incorporating the health inspector reports on restaurants in addition to the uh, user reviews. So, you know, you see examples like this, and you were mentioning, you know, some of the data sets of, you know, where uh, fueling stations are located. These aren't large data sets, but they're highly important, especially they're, they can be highly important to get people to take action and use this information and build on top of it. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the, the small data opportunities you see here? Sure, I mean, I can, I can jump in and talk a little bit. So one of the things that's really exciting with, you know, sometimes we think of these huge, large data sets, right, like you talked about, but often for an individual, uh, a small amount of data can be very, very powerful for them. So, so let me give one example. Teresa, a second ago, talked about MOOCs, these massive open online courses, right? Uh, as students of whatever age, right, learners of any age, are beginning to take more learning experiences online, what that's doing is generating a whole bunch of data that didn't exist before. And so based on that, you can come up with new types of patterns and trends, and you can mine that data in ways that you never could before. So a real quick example of that, um, there's a school in uh, ASU, Arizona State University, right? And they said, we're going to start looking at, we're, we're going to move our, uh, there's the remedial math courses. So students that come to ASU and they're not ready to start math yet, they're, they're basic math courses, they have a online course where they're teaching these, these skills. As students go through that, they're collecting all of the data about that student. Right. So it's not the t it's not human genome level data, right? It's just about that student, but it's a level of data that's way more than you ever had before. So, so the, the example, as I said, well, what do you collect? And so one of the things that we do is we look at the time it takes for students to answer questions. And so you look at this thing. They said I, they showed me this quiz. And they said we have these three answers. Two of them are right. One of them's wrong. How many did the student get right? And they said well, two. Right, duh. Uh, they said no. They only got one right. Because one, they answered within three seconds, they got it right away. The other, they got wrong. The one in the middle, where they got the right answer, they hovered over the wrong answer for 35 seconds before they clicked the right one. So what does it tell us? It tells us they had it down to two and made a 50-50 guess after having to think about it for a long time. That's different than really knowing the answer right away like they did on the first one. So again, that may not be a huge data set, but that's extremely important for that learner. And so I think what we need to start thinking about is how do we do a better job of uh, not only making more data available, but really taking advantage of all of the smaller types of data uh, data sets that we have that can be really really beneficial for uh, individual students. Yeah, I would I would just just echo a lot of that. I mean, I think we're finding more and more that that all useful data is local, right? I mean, it, it's one thing to have a big nationwide data set. People don't tend to hard to care. They say, how what does this mean for my house? What does this mean for my city? All transportation planning is local. What does this mean? You know, what my return on investment if I put solar panels on my roof. Um, and, and so yeah, it's like, you know, getting that data down to the one or two data points that that person really cares about is, is, is a definitely a key problem, for sure. Um, so we talked a, a lot, we spent at least half the time already on, on um, you know, all the opportunities that we're seeing here. I want to dig a little bit into some of the challenges in this space. Um, you know, we've, uh, obviously, um, we have some great experts on the panel who are doing this. Um, there are some agencies where I probably couldn't have invited somebody. Um, so, you know, contrast, you know, you don't have to name names, but, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of successes. How does this, you know, where are you seeing the challenges and, um, you know, barriers in doing this in other places uh, where other agencies either need to, um, you know, do they just need to do it? Are they having different challenges? You know, what can you offer in that area? I'll take a shot at that. Um, I think if you ask every agency if they want to be innovative, nobody's going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so so some of some of it is cultural, and some of it they haven't had permission before. And a lot of that, a lot of this is about leadership uh, and uh, giving that permission. A lot of it's about budget. I mean, we are in extraordinary times in terms of budget and, and, and the programs that people can kind of engage in. Uh, and so you know, policy is a big deal. Policy matters. Uh, there are. Lots of little sorts of barriers. I mean, uh, I'll uh, uh, give Teresa an opportunity to kind of expand on this, but for right now, Amazon just got their FISMA moderate rating. Uh, 
right? Before that, I couldn't have done some of the things that I'm now capable of doing. Uh, I would have had to host a Terramark or something like that, or something that really kind of met those standards. Uh, and so th those are just little barriers, but you, I mean, you've got a CISO who's saying, sorry, <laughs> no no dice, um, you're, you're done. You, you can't do anything there. Uh, and so uh, I think it, well, culture's a big deal, money's a big deal, policy's a big deal. Um, and uh, you know the, the folks who aren't doing it, um, you know, government lacks, and it, it should to a certain extent. DARPA is a forward leaning organization, but you know we're not doing anything that the private sector didn't already figure out, right? For the most part, the uh, you know data catalogs have existed for a very long time, and open data, and, and other folks have led the way. Uh, I think it's just a, 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 an adoption question: how quickly can we kind of adopt and, and kind of tighten up that lag a little bit? Did you want to add to that? Yeah, question? yeah, I would. I, I agree completely. I think the barriers today are some are cultural, some are educational. Like just let, you know, educating the agencies on what new types of tools are available for them to take advantage of. The others are security, as an example. You know, having to walk through. Uh, with the agency's uh, security in the framework, which you know, I, you know, I know we're super committed to, and it's very important if you're going to work in government, any any company. By the way, it's not just government. Security uh, is important for everyone on the internet, right? So security, uh, especially for us who we're a global e-commerce company, so security from day one has always been very important. And when we came into this environment. Uh, within government, ensuring that we knew all the standards and mandates out there for government was priority one, and then meeting those was priority one. But, um, you know, as we talked about, that takes time. That's just process within government, and you can't go around process. But what I am seeing is there are pockets of things that are happening very rapidly around innovation on the periphery and almost moving inward. So things like the learning registry, things that are much more open uh, and available are already happening. So this is just occurring. It's, it's not a matter of uh, if anymore. It is just when and how fast it is happening. So um, in the two years that I've been running the Amazon Web Services public sector business, it's exploded in two years. So I think that we're going to see a, a more rapid rate just because of budgets. I think agencies are now looking because of budget cuts for new ways to do things in a highly cost efficient and effective manner. And because of some of these companies that we talked about, I see a, a new culture of uh, individuals within the government agencies really wanting to try things. And I believe this administration really has pushed this along. Um, the example that I used on Obama for America where they ran their entire campaign on cloud. They didn't build out any infrastructure to do that and because they saw in order to do it fast and efficient and collect better data, and when you talk about uh, predictive analytics, they were pretty effective on the states and how the outcomes were going to be. And that was because they had all the data and the analytics. And I tell everybody, you know, government in some ways is really ahead because, uh, you know, uh, data scientists are the new cool. And, you know, government has had data scientists for a long time. And now you have these universities that are creating curriculum around just this one area. You know, University of San Francisco now has a program, and I'm seeing others really starting. They're reaching out to us wanting to talk about curriculum because they see that this is an area that's, that's really exploding, and they want to have, uh, have the right number of employees that are available. So while there's lots of barriers, I'm, I guess I'm an optimist, and I believe that we're going to get through all of these because the opportunity is really now to be able to do this. Let me ask, uh, and, and you can take this then, um, kind of digging into that, because you both mentioned cost, and I think, you know, obviously this is a huge issue in, in Washington, and uh, it seems to me it has become very clear, and, you know, you're able to give countless examples of where there's public value from what you're doing. Um, but sometimes that doesn't always translate into actually getting the budget to do it. So, you know, is that a challenge? Right now there is, you know, this um, open uh, data initiative that you have this mandate under which you're working. Is there a need for some more structure? Uh, similar to, for example, I mean, you know, we have the e-government act 
2002, which really launched e-government at the federal level and, and pushed it and made it something that was consistent and mandatory and, and was part of federal government that wouldn't be removed. Um, do you, you know, you're in government now, some of you, and others are clearly working with it. So, you know, do you see that as a need right now, or is it um, ingrained enough in the institutions and cultures that you think it will continue without, a, you know, a formal funding mechanisms? I'll jump in on that one. I, I think that the momentum is there. I think much to Teresa's point, the energy is there, the excitement is there, the, the culture has changed. I think the barriers that we're asking. We're not asking people necessarily to, to reskill. We're asking them to use their skills in a different way, um, which is a probably an easier transition once they just decide that they're going to do something a little bit different and think about their job a little bit differently. So, I, I don't. From, from my perspective, it's not necessarily a structural or a mandate um, change that's required. It's going to take a little bit of time. I think that the budget story is a big part of this. I am. I, I tend to lean towards the optimist side on this as well. I think that this type of technology, this type of tradecraft, is what solves a lot of budget woes. We get smarter about how we use our resources, be they energy or education or, or whatever else the case might be. I personally think that's such a compelling story that it's going to continue the momentum on, on this topic. Does anyone else want to add to that? I, I would give a nod for anybody who's not familiar with it uh, to Easy RFP. Uh, the program that Todd Park and the White House are, are spearheading to make it easier to get things through procurement. Uh, procurements, so I don't want to describe procurement as a barrier because it exists for very, very good reasons in all of the processes in there. Uh, but it does slow things down. And so uh, they're making pretty substantial efforts to make the whole RFP process faster and easier, both for the vendors and for the government agencies. So uh, that will only accelerate things. You made a comment a second ago about uh, asking about structure. I think you're talking about it more in the organizational sense, but um, I, I think there is an important piece of structure that we need to keep in mind, which is about uh, coming to some agreement on common data formats. Uh, I think that's probably the more important structure to make this sustainable than organizational pieces. I think there's a lot in place that will make it sustainable, I think, because of things like data paloozas and uh, things like that. We can actually do this in partnerships, sort of public-private partnerships, fairly uh, cheaply. Uh, but at the end of the day, if somebody comes in and says, hey, when I build this great app for uh, you know every college student in the country, and I, I only have to be able to import 15,000 different formats of data, yeah. right? That's not a very attractive proposition for somebody to, to come in and participate in. And so the structure, I think, is, is the community larger with government participating, but uh, coming together and saying, hey, we really can come up with some common formats for this data so that tools can be more interoperable. And that's, I think, the real big thing that's going to uh, help us become sustainable in the future. I'm optimistic about it as well, but it, it, it won't just happen on its own. We have to actively work on that to make it happen. Great. And actually, that, that leads into my next question on this, because as we're, we're thinking about moving forward on this, you know, everyone seems very optimistic on this, so I think that's great. Um, and you mentioned structure of data. It seems that there's um, multiple areas of structure where you have there. We want to be strategic. If you're, if you know now that you're releasing this information, maybe you can be smarter about how you're collecting it or what you're collecting. Um, and it's not just on the output side; it's also on the input side. Uh, if anyone has any thoughts on that, I, I'd love to hear that. Well, I, I mean, just to give an example of what I mentioned a second ago, uh, on the education side, we have a project launch called the Common Education Data Standard, CEDS. This is the first time that the, the Department of Education stepped up and said, this is the common format that we will use for our education data. Uh, that's, that's huge, and that's a good, uh, a good first step. I think there's lots more coming behind it. You can give examples of places that are doing it in your place, but it's, 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 it's worth mentioning that we are actually launching that initiative uh, in order to, to make that happen. And I was just going to say, I agree. I think what's actually happening on getting the getting smarter part is it's, it's like everything else. It comes with experience. So the, the customers, the agencies, the groups that we see that are getting really good at this, they have, you know, the experience really helps because they're understanding what's valuable in there. And sort of another education example, there are now starting to be university presidents that are taking a student card and they're utilizing the data from that to do predictive analysis on how successful they'll be. So if you think about a student that goes in and they look at, are they using the library? Are they using the computer center? Are they using tutorial services? Are they eating in the cafeteria? 
so looking at, you know, how many parking tickets do they have? You know, how many citations, whatever. <laughs> but they can utilize, do they go to sporting events? So they're beginning to look at these kinds of things to do more predictive analysis about, will a student be successful? And, you know, we know, uh, we, we all understand what the rates are with fre the freshman class, right? So they're trying to figure out, how do we make the freshman class uh, at the university level more successful? So it's things like that, and I believe it does come with experience, but uh, it is very important. And again, back to, that's the reason the data scientists are important, these researchers and analysts training on these new tools. It's a new opportunity. And, you know, I heard, I was just in Australia, we launched Australia, and um, the CIO for one of the Smithsonian-like libraries there told me, that he actually, his his now tech team comes in super excited because they're getting to use new tools. He says they're very excited about their, their getting to learn new skills. And I think, again, it's just an opportunity not to replace people, but provide them an opportunity to use the current skills they have and teach them a set of new ones. And I think that's how the experience will, you know, continue to help us get there faster. No, I, want, I, I promise I'd open it up for questions. Uh, we started about five minutes late, so we'll go to 1035. Um, but I'd open it up. Um, if everyone has a question, if you can just uh, state your name and uh, your organization. And uh, go ahead. And uh, I just ask also, you can keep your question uh, to the length of a single tweet, um, <laughs> if possible. And uh, we'll try and keep the, the answer short, too, so we can get through a lot of these. Thanks. My name is Sally Bory, and I'm with Phase One Consulting Group, and I work with data.gov. And um, just wanted everybody to know that at the end of March, we're going to be uh, doing a new launch. Um, we've been working with the Open Knowledge Foundation to add CCAN, to use CCAN for the data catalog. So we expect a, a lot um, uh, to be easier to use and have more capabilities. OK, that's probably two tweets. Here's my question. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about is that within agencies, a lot of people who have the data, who are the subject matter experts, maybe never connect with the developers or the CIO levels, and they know what to do with the data, but the other the CIO people don't. So what are you doing in your agencies to kind of try to release that aspect? I, I, let me I'm, yay, let me answer that question. So <laughs> I, I, I say that only because we've we've spent a lot of time in education thinking about that. So we're going to have an updated version of our education uh, open data page. Uh, it will be coming out soon. And one of the changes is we have ass assigned a person, a real live actual person, with every data set. So everybody that comes in that says, "Hey, I kind of get this data set, but I'm not exactly sure what it means," can click and actually connect to somebody who knows about that data set. And part two of that is. We actually give suggestions on each data set for what tools we think could be made out of it. So it could say, hey, this could be made into a really great tool to help recommend a good college for a student based on you know their performance over the last five years. So those are two things that, that we do because I think that's really, really important. That will be coming out within the next couple months. If you look on healthdata.gov for any of the individual data sets that are cataloged there, there's the opportunity to ask a question and to share an idea. So if you've got something maybe you're not capable of developing yourself, you're like, it would be great if somebody used this information for X. Uh, you, you have the opportunity to share that. Uh, again, inside the agency, there's a cultural, you know, there are people who are not used to doing this sort of thing. And so you kind of have to buy them cupcakes and coffee and convince them that they want to do this. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of that going on. Uh, and, um, you know, it'll, it'll take a little time, but I think it's going to happen. There's a question that came in via Twitter that was um, asking for federal uh, agencies or departments that don't have really an IT department. Are there tools available to help them use data or make data available? Yes. Uh, well, data.gov data. Uh, data. Is, is kind of the crown jewel in terms of platform for, uh, you know, so we are, we've emulated what data.gov did at, the, at our agency level, and the smaller operating divisions that don't have their own budgets can ride along with us. Uh, and so I would encourage them to get in touch with Gene Holm or yourself or anybody at the GSA if they need help. So that's what we're there for. Hi, I am with Telecom Teleboutique. Um, we are working on a project, World Bank project, for a study in Africa for e-government. And how do you see uh, the data innovation has potential for developing countries where they don't have data actually electronically available? And do you have any guidelines for the initiatives these countries can take? 
Who wants to volunteer for that? Well, I'll start with just um, per getting the infrastructure in place. So I think they can just they can first of all look at the model that the U.S. government has put in place. I think it's a great model. When I go around the world globally now, I see many countries picking up and utilizing our model that we started here or a similar model. So I think they should absolutely pay attention uh, and look at how the U.S. government started to put the building blocks in place. So that's one thing, just to, you know, start at the beginning. But then they can also now utilize tools, cloud-based tools. They don't need all the infrastructure. They do need some, you know, they got to have internet access and some bandwidth. So, but they can begin to utilize a lot of the tool sets are at, that are actually available to them online. And also, um, there's lots of processes and policies and templates that are out there, you know, that are highly available and open for them just to begin to research. So, if they don't have any process in place at all, I do think they should look at where the U.S. government actually started. Because again, it is a program that is recreated pretty much worldwide in some variation. There, there are lots of resources. Like the Gates Foundation is doing tons of work in developing countries to get you know, clean water for malaria. And so uh, you have to have internet access to have a smartphone and, and an application to help you. But um, you know, I think there are existing resources that can be kind of leveraged as well. Um, first off, you know, I want to congratulate you that you actually have the grand dame of information technology sitting at the table with the rest of the boys. So I want to point out that they don't recognize Teresa being in the trenches. I think I think you started when you were 14. Absolutely. And you didn't pay me to say that, and I do want my Amazon services for free for the rest of the year. But, um, I'm Richard Seeline uh, with the National Regional Data Consortium. But um, I kind of want to go back to almost the root of this, Teresa, for you and the others. If you all are successful, meaning that you are going to be successful, and this administration has made a big push to ensure that. Um, this is totally disruptive, which means that the more you're successful, the more it's going to prove two things, one of which is I was with a congressman yesterday who is a part of the conservative right, which confirms for me how all this is going to come together on both sides of the aisle. And that is, not only is it going to improve efficiency and effectiveness, it's going to prove in some way or another that certain roles of government should not be done by government, all right? And that there should be more public-private partnerships. So if you carry this out for the next two, three years, I want to get some sense that the agencies, the departments, and to some degree, Congress truly, really understand that this is going to disrupt government services, hopefully in a positive way, and is that truly embedded in the DNA of the agencies to accept what that endpoint's going to be? Am I making sense? You're going to be out of a job if you're successful. Are, are, we, are we accepting of that in the DNA, so to speak, or is this really we're just going to kind of do a few things around the margins and then hope that we successfully get a metric and move on? So, so I think... Um I mean, you're, you're spot on. It will definitely change the role of, of government and what our, our jobs are. Um, but, but one of the things I think is, so yes, there are things that we need to do to make sure you know, budgets for this are sustainable and infrastructure is sustainable. There's all that sort of stuff. But I think the bigger thing is, is shifting the culture of citizens. So citizens did not, certainly in the education space, which I'm familiar with, didn't sort of look at it as their right to access <coughs> their data. They looked at it as something they kind of get. I, I drove my own school crazy because, you know, this is what you get when you're a data nerd like me. And I walk in and say, give me all my kids' records in an open, interoperable format. And they're like, can I print it for you? Right now, and I, and I, we go to a great school. But as this is shifting and as this data is becoming more available, students and parents and, and citizens are realizing that it is their right to have access to their data. And that's not going to change. And so even as... Uh, you know, administrations change and things shift and, and change up. That right will still be something that, that uh, citizens understand as more and more tools are developed, and that will force, it will hold the feet to the fire of it, people in all parts of whatever administration is in place in the future to make sure that service is provided. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you for all your insight. I mean, I've been taking more notes than I normally do. I'm Alan Gregerman. I run a consulting firm, and our business is really about how do you kind of create remarkable connections with customers and work in lots of different industries? And so 
what I'm trying to think about is how we could have the capability, and all of you are very <coughs> kind of smart, so you ought to be able to solve this. It's really simple. To, in essence, figure out how we actually drive all the data that would be relevant to citizens so we don't simply have this all available and hope that informed citizens connect with some data that matters to them, but that we have as a policy, if all this data matters to people, that we know enough about our customers, citizens of the U.S., that we can actually figure out how to connect with them and cause them to take initiative to get health data or education data or any type of data that will actually improve the quality of their life and development. Can I just say something about that and then the agency should take that, but <clears throat> I just want to share, I'm an advocate for the Amazon.com model. So um, one of the things that we're really working to create with Amazon Web Services, we have a marketplace. And my goal for government education is to create a marketplace where is if a researcher, let's say a researcher from NIH or a researcher from NASA, Need you know interested tools or SDKs that they would go at just like you buy a pair of tennis shoes. They would go up and they would look at all these tools and they might select one and say, "I want to download and look at this tool." Up would pop four or five other tools that says individuals like you also looked at these tools. So I think part of it is providing a common thinking. So beginning to create that environment where you have knowledge, which I know scares some people, but where you have more knowledge about likes and dislikes and buying behaviors and patterns because it can be overwhelming, I think. Data can, and I even find myself today, if I'm going to stay at a hotel or I travel, I go up and I look, I search, what are people saying? And I really look at two or three different sites because I want to make sure that it's not sort of being baked in, if that makes sense. But I, I really use the information, and I, I take it sort of at, 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 you know, at what value it seems to bring for me. But I'm an advocate of tr trying to create that model for government and for citizens, to push to citizens, to sort of show, look, here's if you were this person living in this state or this county or this area, here's the kinds of things you might need to know about. But, the, I mean, the challenge, and then I don't want to interrupt everybody talking about the challenge is, so I now buy a zillion things from Amazon, so now Amazon kind of tracks me, they're kind of stalking me in an exciting way and pushing out all these things that I should buy, so that's really cool. But 90-some percent of people don't have a connection with the government other than paying taxes or not paying taxes. They haven't opted in to a system like Amazon, yep. so, and for a lot of those, they're the ones who <coughs> most need to figure out how to save money on energy, so, to figure out how to make educational choices. How do we connect them in a way? How do we create this free event and, in fact, get connected to government so we can drive all this value to you? Here's what I think is going to happen, right? And so uh, the truth points out that the good stuff will will surface. And you know, 30 years ago now, they opened up all the weather data. Uh, then President Clinton opened up all the GPS data, right? And so you've got application developers around the world who are trying to find great applications to build and so part of our job is to make them aware, right? So, you know, this is this is all new. This is, you know, we're opening this stuff up in the last three or four years where it's been hidden for a very, very long time. Uh, and so, you know, part of it is just awareness, but great applications will out or we'll learn that the stuff we're curating isn't all that valuable. And hey, let's A, save money by stop doing that. And by the way, it would be great if you could do the other thing. Like there's, there's a data set that the government should actually be capturing that you're not. Uh, and so you know, one point on the other question about our jobs going away, like I've been trying to marginalize myself for 20 years, so I'm not, I'm not personally afraid of that. But there is something to be said for trusted source, right? So I don't think government's role as regulator and trusted source of information curation is going to go away. I don't think we're going to relegate that to the private sector in a way that the vast majority of people are going to be completely comfortable with. Uh, and so on some level, I think the government's job is to be that trusted source on some level. Uh, and you know, in that respect, I think, um, you know, I think we'll be fine. So. And I just, I just want to say, just let me say, I believe what David said is very true. Back to you. My mother's 84 and uses a, a smartphone device. And I think you're, you're, you're actually, maybe there's a lot more people out there that are connecting now. Uh, and, and things are really changing, and it's about these data sets being opened up and creating these uh, public-private partnerships to allow the access to get there. And it's going to be over time. It's not going to happen overnight. So.
We're going to take uh, two more quick questions. There's one back there. So, oh, give me that. All right, then the one back there, then right here. Hi, my name is Brad Reichard, and I just I I think it might be building on the other question, but it what I'm focused on is being able to tell the success story, being able to talk about the consequence to the American consumer, the data consumer, which I heard you say, and I really liked that a lot because I feel like that's what this is about. You know, what you know, have there been some as early adopters up here, I will say, you know, coming up with these killer apps. Where has been some of the most exciting traction where people have gotten it? I don't know if it's through, you know, channels like media or marketing or whatever it is that you're doing to push this out, but maybe one success story or two success story that I can go home and uh, bone up on. Thanks. I, I think we can all we can all give many, so I'll try to just one real quick and we can go down the aisle. So, for example, uh, right now, right off the bat, you can go into anybody that fills out the uh, uh, any of their student online data. It's one of the things I talked about for like financial aid stuff, right? Also coming in just a, just a, uh, another couple weeks will be uh, all the information that somebody puts in to fill out a FAFSA form online. You'll be able to download all that. Now, one quick example, just one. Somebody, a company here, actually local in D.C., personal.com said, we will take all of that data that you fill out, your, your information data about education, we will put it in our dashboard, and right away, you no longer have to enter that in over and over and over again. Every time you go to fill out another school, every time you go to fill out another uh, financial aid calculator, all that, that crazy stuff. We have heard, I just heard a story the other day about a student who was not able, he, he's a uh, native, uh, uh, this is English's second language learner. None of his family had gone to college. Extremely difficult process. We're asking him to go through all the paperwork. We ask him to fill out. It's really, it's a complicated process. Was able to get help by one person one time, getting the right information into personal, into this tool, and from then on was able to apply to everything else without having to enter in any more information about their financial situation, which, which is very difficult to him. That's one case of one example of one student who was able to go to college because we were able to make data easier for him to use. So I think we'll see lots more examples like that, and I can tell you more afterwards, but that's one from here. Yeah, for, for I mean, there, there are lots of examples. I think there, you know, so the, the weather example is a popular one because it's the home run or, or the blockbuster movie, whereas, you know, I think this is a, a long tail model. You're going to have lots of very, you know, many, many niche kind of wins here. One, one that I like to talk about is the city of San Francisco used Medicare claims data to be in aggregate to understand kind of the, uh, the where all the diabetics were. And they built clinics in those areas to make it easier for people to get to medical professionals just by knowing kind of how those things are clustered. Uh, and so, you know, that's just one example of a million. I used the, the Bon Jovi example before about homeless folks finding shelters with beds, knowing when doctors were going to be there. And so, you, you know, then, then there's the Nike Fit app. You know, there's all sorts of applications out there that are uh, you can point to and say they're using government data. <coughs> And uh, so I'll, I'll just stop us there. I, I, sorry, we can't do the last question, but you can have the first question of the next event if you come. Uh, and, and clearly, <laughs> clearly, we can continue this for a while, and we will. So again, uh, you have the program. I encourage you to come out to our event at noon, um, and you know we look forward to doing this in the future. So look for this again in 2014. Thank you. Thank you.